Our Old Testament lesson this morning is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, found in your pew Bible at page 487. The Lord appears to Isaiah, purifies him, and sends him out to speak the Lord's message. Isaiah 6, beginning with the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. <clears throat> he said, go and, tell this, go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leaves stumps when they are cut down, so will the holy seed will be the stump in the land. The New Testament lesson is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, page 843 in your pew Bible. Paul commands Timothy to continue preaching God's word, telling the good news whenever he can in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? Found in Matthew 13. Verses 1 through 23, page 690 in your pew Bible. Jesus tells the parable of the sower, the seed, and the four soils, and teaches about how people receive God's word. Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. 
The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Here is the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. It's always good to be reminded that we have choices in life. Our whole life is full of choices that we make. I'm thankful that when it comes to the store, I don't have to spend much time worrying about shampoos or hair clips. So, <laughs> There's a lot of material we could talk about in Isaiah chapter 6. Um, and, you know, when I put the lessons together, I sometimes wonder, or I, I think I'll go one direction and I choose the New Testament readings and the, the sermon ends up being on something else altogether. Uh, but Isaiah 6 is so full of good material uh, about which we could speak, about which we could meditate on. Uh, it could take weeks to go through it. It's the story of the call of Isaiah, and it may or may not be his original call. It's at the beginning of a section running through chapter 12, really. Some people divide it in different ways, but it looks like to me it goes right on through chapter 12, dealing with the threat of invasion by Assyria. This is a, a very crucial time in the history of the kingdom of Judah. And so it was a very important time for Isaiah, but especially for the king and for the nation itself. Uh, this section also contains some of the Old Testament's clearest prophecies about the Messiah. Some of our favorite Christmas texts are from here. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. These are given in this section of Isaiah, chapter 7 and chapter 9, are where those particular verses are from. There's a lot of predictions and promises about the fate of the nation's, uh, of Ju Judah's fate in these chapters. And so it's a really important time, and so I think it's not a coincidence that this vision is reported right here at the beginning of these, this important time. For Isaiah had a message to preach, but it would fall on deaf ears. That's kind of the gist of the whole section. And yet it was a story that needed to be told, a word from God that the nation needed to, to hear. But what I'd like to deal on today is to kind of point out the progression of the Christian life, something that all of us deal with, uh, whether big or small, old or young, and from whatever time period. Uh, our, our illustration comes from the life of Isaiah, this experience of his call. And there's three stages I want to look at, three stages of our Christian life. First stage, sinner. Secondly, saint. 
And thirdly, one who is sent. Sinner, saint, and sent. So if you turn to Isaiah 6, if you want to follow along, I'm going to uh, look at just a few of these verses. In chapter 1, or verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. And then going down to verse 5, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You know, a lot of times as we talk about the need for national repentance, we think, well, it's those other guys out there that need to repent. We're doing pretty good here. I'm not guilty of adultery. I'm not guilty of murder or whatever sin we might happen to be thinking of at the moment. But as Isaiah points out, not only was his sin the sin of unclean lips, but the national sin was unclean lips. In other words, their speech was terrible. They lied to one another. Everything they said couldn't be trusted. They weren't faithful to one another nor to God. And it all manifested in the way they spoke. It's like the man said, you can't walk through a mud puddle without getting a little bit dirty. And so as we think of national repentance, how can we live in a nation guilty of sin X and not have some part in it ourselves? And Isaiah illustrates that. But even more important point to me at least is, the, is Isaiah's reaction when he saw the Lord. You know, I've, I've mentioned several times, I think, that uh, the Bible has 365 instances, 366 actually, where it says, do not fear, even, even the day on leap, leap year is covered. So, you know, there's a do not fear. And most of the time, or every time that an angel shows up, much less God, what's the first reaction of the people? They're stricken with fear. And here Isaiah is seeing the Lord Almighty on his throne. And the angels or the seraphs are actually singing the song, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. When the Apostle John saw his glimpse of heaven, they were singing that same song. You know, I think that would be a good song to learn because we're going to be learning it sooner or later anyways if we're going to heaven. But Isaiah's reaction then was that of fear. Woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a great sinner. It's a normal reaction. When Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah to the disciples, and particularly to Peter on the, the occasion of the miraculous catch of fish the first time, Peter fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. That shame and guilt that we know we're guilty of things when, when God comes into our lives, it comes to the foreground when we catch a glimpse of God. When Jesus appeared to Paul at his conversion, Paul fell to the ground and was blinded for a time until, again, he was healed by the Lord's uh, hand through Ananias. And, and Paul later testified in 1 Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. I am the worst. And the Apostle John, again in Revelation, when he saw the resurrected and ascended Christ, and keep in mind, this is the same Apostle John, the beloved disciple who spent over three years in Jesus' company. He knew him intimately. And yet when he saw this vision of Christ the King, the resurrected and ascended one, the Alpha and Omega, John said, I fell at his feet as though dead. When there's a vision of Almighty God, when we catch a vision of him, when we find ourselves in his presence, the only reaction we can have is to fall on our face and cry out in our sin, in our despair, because we know God is holy beyond reproach, and we know we have not lived up to that standard. It's an amazing fact. You know, we exalt saints, we put a capital S saint in front of their names, and and they have statues in Rome and other places and churches get named after them. But the most one of the more amazing things I find about those people, about the saints, the capital S saints, the closer one they, people get to God, the more they feel their unworthiness, the more clearly they see their sin. 
And those of us who don't classify ourselves with those as the great ones of God, we think, how can you be like that? How can you not see how wonderful of a Christian you are? But they're living in God's bright, brighter light, so to speak, and that shows up the dirt. In evening, when the lights are kind of low, you don't see a lot of cobwebs in the corner, do you? But when you turn the lights on in light of day or when the sun shines through the window, you can see every speck of dust, and that's the way it is in our lives. God draws us to himself. He says, draw near to me. He invites us to come to him. But when we get there, we see how great of need we have of him. Because, as the Bible says, our sins have separated us from God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And poverty of spirit is simply humility, the grace to see ourselves as we really are. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, wherever a tree falls, there it lies. It's not over here, it's not there, it's where it fell which is a description of humility. And St. Francis said it this way, whatever a man is in, his, in God's sight, that's what he is and nothing more. We live so much of our lives trying to convince ourselves and other people of, of a certain image we project when that's not us at all. But we never, ever fool God. And if we're smart, we won't try to fool ourselves as well. But the Lord says this in Isaiah 66, This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each of us has turned to his own way. And so like Isaiah, we too are sinners. Let us also like Isaiah confess our sinfulness before God. So Isaiah the sinner. But then we go to verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 6, 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And just a little reminder, burning coals and fire is a a symbol in the Bible, a symbol of purification, a symbol of holiness. And fire, and it's, it's like electricity or it's like a lot of things. It depends on what it's used for. It can kill or it can enrich our lives. That's the picture of fire. It destroys evil, but it purifies what is good. That's why our faith is compared to gold, because fire will make it better. It will get out the impurities and make it more pure. Upon Isaiah's confession of sin, the Lord forgave him, symbolized by that seraph touching uh, his, his lips and burning away his sin. The Bible says if we, are, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will, will, not maybe, not might, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to point out the definiteness of that statement. He will forgive. He will cleanse from all unrighteousness, not just most of it. Most of us know we have our favorite little vice, our pet sin. God cleanses us from us all. And when he brings something to mind that he wants you to repent of, that's the time to bring it to the foot of the cross and leave it there. Because he will forgive and he will cleanse from all sin. In John chapter 1, the Bible says that to all those who receive Christ, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What an awesome statement that is. Children of God, born from above, born of God the Father. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin, that is Christ, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
And that's called the great exchange, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the great exchange. Although we all sin, when Christ died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. He identified with every sin that you and you and you and everybody in the whole history of the world ever committed. Jesus said, that's my sin. Punish me, God, I'm taking it on myself. And when Jesus did that, he gave us his righteousness, his perfection, his holiness. Because he committed no sin, no deceit was ever found on his lips. The great exchange. I find it interesting that the New Testament calls us believers. It calls us disciples. It calls us saints. It doesn't ever call us sinners. We're saints. Can you say that? I am a saint. I am a saint. Say it with me. I am a saint. Of course we still commit sins because we still have this flesh of the body. But we're not known to God as sinners, so why call ourselves that? We're known as a saint. A saint. We need God's grace nonetheless until the last day, but saints in the eyes of God. When Jesus looks upon, when God the Father looked upon Jesus on the cross, he saw nothing but sinfulness. And because of Christ's death on the cross, when he looked at those of us who believe that Christ died for our sins, he sees Jesus. That's why we're called saints. I'd like to read, I know it's always kind of risky to read from the pulpit instead of just talk or, or follow notes, but uh, Spurgeon made a, had a, de a devotion I just had to share this morning about this very thing. Taken from Genesis 1-5, it says, the Bible says, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening was darkness and the morning was light, yet the two together are called by the name that is given to the light, day. This is rather remarkable, but it has an exact analogy in spiritual experience. There is darkness and light in every believer, yet the believer is not to be called a sinner even though there is sin in him. He is to be called saint because he possesses some degree of holiness. This should be a very comforting thought to those who are mourning over their weakness and who ask, can I be a child of God while there is so much darkness in me? Yes, you can, for you, like the day, take your name not from the evening but from the morning. You are spoken of in the word of God as if you are even now perfectly holy, as you will be soon. When Jesus said, be holy because the Lord your God is holy, he spoke that in the present tense. It's going to happen. You're going to be perfect. You're going to be holy. You will shine like the sun and like the stars in the kingdom of our Father. So it is written in Daniel. Isaiah was a saint. But we too who believe in Christ Jesus as our Savior are saints. Let us receive that forgiveness and regard ourselves as God does, a saint of God. Isaiah was a sinner. Isaiah was a saint. And then Isaiah was sent. He was sent out to preach to prophesy, to counsel, to bring God's message to the people. After he was forgiven and cleansed, Isaiah was given a task. And guess what? That's the same progression for us. We cannot come to Christ without humility, without laying our sins at the foot of the cross and confessing them and being made new. We cannot go any further until we receive Christ's forgiveness. But once we receive that forgiveness, once we become saints of God, we too are sent into the world. We may not be called, like Isaiah, to counsel kings and high priests and presidents and so forth, government officials, even from other nations. Our jobs may be prison guards and school teachers and janitors and farmers and all sorts of other things. But it's a calling from God nonetheless because there's people in our world, in our circle of acquaintance, that need God's message. 
and he puts you there to give it to them. We all are sent into our world with God's message. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's our point of being. That's our purpose. Because we're not saved. We're not made saints just for our own benefit alone, but for God's glory. And God's glory is shown when others come to him as well. God's glory is shown when we do good, when we show our faith by the things we say and the life that we lead. Again, referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 18. God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. It was said that God, only God can make Stradivarius violins, but he does it through the hand of Antonio Stradivarius. God uses us as his instruments to create new life in others through our word of testimony, by sharing the word of God. And we're sent into the world to do that very thing. Isaiah was sent. And all Christians also, all who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior, are also sent into our world. I've been reading lately about the Rolling Stones, first the Beach Boys and now the Rolling Stones, those you know, long hair that rock, rock and roll, that'll never last. That's what we heard in the 60s. And here they are 50 years later still playing still together. And I read about the Rolling Stones that it was noted that one reason that they were still together was that they put the band first ahead of their own individual aspirations, their own individual goals, their own interests. We belong to something much greater than a rock and roll band, don't we? The kingdom of God. Whose interests control our lives? Sinner to saint, to sent. May Christ have his way in our lives, even as he did in Isaiah's. In Jesus' name, amen.